the God of all creation, the one who created, formed, and fashioned you, the one who knit you together in your mother's womb, the one who knows every hair on your head, the one whose thoughts toward you outnumber the sands, the one who paints the morning sky, the one who breathed stars into existence, the one who measures the waters with the wave of his hand, the one who created every thumbprint like no other, the one who carved the canyons and seas. He is intimately acquainted with all of your ways. He calls you his very own. He says you are beloved, chosen, wanted, precious in his sight. He has designed you for destiny. He put purpose inside of you. He has very good plans for your life. His goodness and mercy follow you daily. He promises to never leave or forsake you. He is near, closer than any other. He takes great delight in you. His banner over you is love. He rejoices over you with singing. He surrounds you with songs of deliverance. He is your protector, provider, redeemer, and refuge. He is matchless and merciful, full of compassion and abounding in mercy. He loves you with an everlasting love. He is faithful and he is for you. There is no one like our God. He is above and before all things. He sees you. He knows you. He calls you by name. There is nothing in all of creation that can separate you from his love. You are his. Good morning, Allen Bible. How are you doing this morning? Man, it's great to be with you. And I would love to invite you to stand, and if you're able, and, and sing with us this morning. Uh, before, we, before we jump in, I just want to read a short passage uh, just for us. This is from Lamentations 3. Uh, just as we think about singing about the faithfulness of God, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. This is verse 22. His mercies never come to an end, and they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. And uh, what I love about that passage is that comes in the book of Lamentations, where the people are lamenting about being in exile. And uh, But there's still a, just a hint uh, of God's faithfulness and his promises. And so I just would love to invite us to sing about that, sing about his promises, sing about his faithfulness. And uh, it's great to be with you this morning. Your history could prove 
There's nothing you can't do. Be faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And then my heart, then when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faith. now has ended in the kingdom of light in the kingdom of light forever under your dominion you're the king of my life you're the king of my life and you reign above it all you reign
This morning, thank you that it resonates deep within us. Even if we have acted in rebellion, as if you didn't reign above all and above us, as if you weren't king, or we acted in just indifference and forgetfulness, not remembering you throughout this week, thank you that it resonates true, that you are worth all of our praise, you're worth us giving you our attention this morning, our affections following, and our obedience out of that affection, pleasing you. Lord, we pray that worship when we leave this place will be because we've truly worshiped now and where we've sung things that we don't match up with or align with. Lord, we ask your forgiveness and grace. We thank you for that grace. We pray you might draw us back into fellowship with you as the real us meets with the real you. We thank you that we get the privilege before you say that one, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, we want to do that this morning. Not when one day it will just be required, but as a response. A response of awe, a response of gratitude and a recognition that you do reign above all that your name is above all names and that we are called to bear your image and your name in this world. So strengthen us, as, even as we praise you, strengthen us so that we might worship you, and we might reflect you as we leave. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I want to welcome you to Allen Bible Church. Uh, glad you're here to worship with us. Uh, my name is Buddy. I serve as one of the pastors here. I'm grateful that you're here. If you are newer with us, there's two ways you could let us know um, who you are, so we might let you know more about Allen Bible if that's a desire of yours. There's a QR code on the screen. There's also one on almost every seat back. Uh, in front of you, and you can scan that and give us your info, and we're not a scary people, but we do like to follow up with you and say, hey, here's what we're about. We'd love to get to know you more, and so that's a way for you to do that. Uh, also, if you're part of our church family, whether you're a member or you're a friend of Allen Bible, uh, we remind one another to give as part of our worship today to declare his worth, also to declare our trust in him as he's provided for us to give back to him out of what he has blessed us with. It's also a way to invest in what God is doing in and through Allen Bible. 
I'm not going to go through any events or ministries today. Um, you can go to our website and find fall happenings and all that and sign up for our email there. What I want to do, though, is turn our attention for a moment as we are gathered. We do that uh, rhythmically, uh, weekly, most of the time, sometimes even more than once a week, to encourage and equip one another um, to live out our vision. Our vision uh, is to live deployed as Christ's ambassadors among our neighbors, the nations, and the next generation, however God has wired you and me, and wherever he locates you. And so that's pictured in these icons, but we hope that it's also pictured, imaged, and embodied in you and me when we leave this place. I'm going to bring up uh, Brian Mosley in just a second. He serves as one of our elders, but he has a very unique opportunity um, to go across the globe to meet with other folks and get um, kind of what's the reading on how is the image of God being um, reflected in the world? Um, how are we reflecting it? How are people being reached with the gospel? Uh, and so it's part of, they, they mispronounce it, I think. It's called Luzon. The way it's spelled, I say Lausanne, but it's Luzon. Um, and it's a worldwide, I think they even call it a congress. So there's only a couple hundred or so delegates, I think that's what they're called, from North America, and Brian Mosley is one of those who's going over. So he's going over on behalf of you and on behalf of uh, God's church worldwide. So we're excited. He hated I said all that. But I want you to watch this video. It'll give you, It's one minute. It'll give you a glimpse and a little bit of taste. What, why does this uh, thing happen every now and then? What's the objective? And you'll see there's a swath of the world that will be there, and Brian will be one of those. So Brian, you come on up. Y'all watch this video, and then I'm going to have him share. In a world marred by division, rage, indifference, selfishness, fear, we are doing something different. For 50 years, we have been coming together to lay aside our own agendas and act together as one for God's global mission. Because together is better. Together we are leaders from every continent across the generations. With shared additional passions. We want to see the world healed in Christ. Summon. We want to see the nations rejoice. Awesome. We want to lay down our swords. And take up our crosses. We want the gospel to reach every person. Tareya. We want disciple making churches for every people and place. Hanke. We want Christ like leaders in every church and sector. Edu. We want to see the kingdom impact in every sphere of society. Each. Together. Together. Pamoda. We are accelerating global mission. Together. All right, so that's just a quick taste. This is Brian, um, and Brian, my question to you, you can just go wherever you want, um, is how have you been preparing for this? Like, what, what is that? What have you been doing? What are you looking forward to there? How can we pray for you? Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, like Buddy shared, like that video kind of tried to capture. So, um, for about 50 years, this Luzon ministry has been trying to help bring together um, global church leaders and ministry leaders to think about how do we work together to reach the world for Christ and help churches um, be supporting their discipleship efforts. So, yeah, so it's a real honor to get to go um, and be a part of it, representing our Bible Church and the ministry I work with right now, Media. And i personally just looking forward to interacting with so many different leaders from around the world. Um, there's about 5,000 people that will be there in Seoul, South Korea. Um, like Buddy said, they've tried to really make it proportionate to kind of the world population, so it's not just dominated by North Americans. So they've limited, you know, who's coming from different parts of the world so that it, it is representative of the numbers of people from that part of the world. You know, the church is, is most active in the South, um, so, you know, Southern um, Hemisphere. So South America, Africa is where the church is just really exploding compared to, you know, in America and other parts of the Northern Hemisphere. So it's really cool to see, and, and I'm looking forward to meeting and engaging with a lot of these leaders from around the world, particularly where the church is really thriving. So, I mean, you can certainly pray for me, but also just pray that God would use that moment. They, this, Luzon, this Luzon ministry basically started about 50 years ago. Billy Graham, John Stott, and some others brought these leaders together in Luzon, Switzerland. That was the first time they'd ever done it. Um, that was a powerful moment uh, 50 years ago, and so they've done it now three times prior to this one in Seoul about every 10 to 12 years gathered these leaders from around the world. And so this is, um, doesn't happen every year, kind of a unique deal to bring folks together. And so honored to be a part of it. So you get a bonus question. So didn't y'all have to have come up with four or five questions or like from North America, hey, here's what we think. Isn't that what y'all are doing there? 
Um, yes, kind of. So yeah, um, you, you correct me. Go so ahead. Uh, last year in Chicago, they brought together the folks from North America that would be traveling to Seoul this year. And so, yeah, we started to talk and engage on, you know, what are some of the issues that the North American church is facing? Um, so we can kind of add that to the mix of, of questions and conversations that will happen in Seoul next week. Um, and so, again, they're trying very hard to not make it a North American-dominated, you know, um, conference. But we're part of the church, too. So we're trying to, you know, interject where we're at as a church, you know, just um, as a country and as a, as a nation. And then also then learn from the other nations around the world. So, yeah, so there was a meeting last year um, that started that process. And then there's just been kind of a journey leading up to this trip where they've been asking us to, you know, pray and be thoughtful. And they just released a big um, State of the Great Commission report, which is a, a big worldwide study they did around, you know, what is the status of the gospel being, um, you know, spread and proclaimed in different parts of the world and what's that like. So they're, they're trying to be a thought leader in this area of evangelization as well as then bringing people together to learn and, and help and figure out how we can work together. Awesome. All right, let's pray. Lord, uh, so grateful for uh, friendship with Brian, his leadership here amongst us, and we send him with um, eagerness and expectation of what you'll do in him and then in us as he comes back, what you'll do through him in conversations that are both in the formal settings but especially those informal ones. Pray for divine appointments there. Pray that he would have some aha moments where you just personally um, open his eyes to something you want him to see and perhaps come back and share with us. We pray, Father, that he would bring back uh, to us um, ways in which we can uh, think about what are the key questions we need to be asking ourselves or way maybe some adjustments where we get more aligned with where you're at work in the world, where you're at work advancing the gospel of your son and the gospel of your kingdom. And I uh, pray for Brian's travel that there be no issues, pray that he have no food issues, um, pray that, uh, that the, the team that he goes with, even that he knows from Chicago, uh, that there be a great uh, sense of bonding. And again, Lord, we look forward to how you'll answer, not just through Brian and, and through us uh, as a result, but across the globe to see where you are at work. And may we just be eager and quick ourselves to join in. We love you and put Brian in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids, you're dismissed, first through fourth grade, and we'll continue in worship if you'll stand. Oh, the perfect Son of God, in all his innocence, walking in the dirt with you. knows what living is he's acquainted with our grief the man of sorrow son of suffering Blood and tears. 
place to be the son of suffering to die be buried to raise again so that we can experience new life and uh, God I pray as we open your word now that we would be pointed to that truth and uh, be reminded of that and um, that even in a fallen world today God that we can that's truth that we can cling to and be reminded of and so father we love you and we trust you in Jesus name I pray amen team. <clears throat> if you uh, have a Bible, go ahead and flip to the very first page-ish, the book of Genesis. Uh, we continue our series that we began last week. I'll catch you up if you weren't here or if you forgot it all. I'll try to catch us up really fast. You'll see here's a, a compass. Go back, go back. Uh, a compass, and we, we're doing a series called Repurposed, and really just acknowledging we live in some difficult times, some disheartening times, some disorienting times. And so part of what we're trying to do is go, where are we? <laughs> and how did we get here? And particularly ask ourselves as followers of Christ, what story are you living in? Um, and we, we threw out some crazy stories from Babylon way back when, and these deities, you know, were animals and killing each other and then the blood became stars all that sounds crazy except for also we have narratives in our world that yeah they don't have uh, a fish goddess being cut in half and half in the stars and half on the ground but there are many that are like well you just do you and this is all about you and your you know grand self-expression and that's a narrative as well but we also talked about as Christians we actually 
often don't realize we operate with an incomplete story because we typically think of ourselves within the framework of Genesis 3 to Revelation 20. The problem is there's a Genesis 1 and 2, and there's a Genesis, I mean, Revelation 21 and 22, the bookends of the Bible, if you will. It's important to know how the story began and was intended to go, to go forward, and it's important to know how God particularly promises the story will end, which will also be a beginning of a never-ending story. But we, as Christians, well-intended, and uh, it's the bulk of what's happening in the Bible, tend to live between uh, Genesis 3 with the fall. You can actually put it up there now. This is a better framework. We typically are just those two in the middle. We don't realize it, but we're like, well, we know there's sin in the world. We know this place is awful. Things are not the way they're supposed to be, and we need to fix that, and there needs to be a cure, and what is that? And we want people to know you can't do it on your own. You can't make yourself good enough to be right with God. So he actually took care of that, and he sent Jesus. Yes, that is a pronounced, you know, put it in bold print, exclamation points. The gospel is that truth that we are not right with God because of our sin. God had to, and is the only one who could make us right with him, and the only way we're made right is not of our own effort, but in putting our trust in the place taker. We've sung about it. Michael even prayed about it just now. Him being the son of suffering, Jesus Christ, who took your place and mine on the cross because we couldn't clean ourselves up. So that's a, that's a fantastic story. It's a true story. It's just not the whole story. And so last week what we did was said we want to get reoriented because here's, here's why we said that. Therefore, if that's the story, then we tend to think, well, what do I do with my everyday stuff? And what about my job? I mean, I, I teach third graders, and nowadays I can barely get them to even sit still to do a lesson. Or I'm a, a janitor at, a, at the, you know, a, a business building, and no one even knows my name. What, what's, you know, how, how is my work Valuable, or I'm a lawyer. Everybody makes jokes about me and hates me until they need me. So you at least felt needed then and significant then, right? But how, how does our that that plays out in our work? That plays out in our in our households. If we think that life is basically about getting everyone who's a sinner to be cured of that problem, and therefore every job becomes JV unless you're on the varsity on this stage. Uh, preaching or a missionary or going to South Korea for a, a evangelization conf congress. Like we tend to think that we should esteem, uh, give double honor to those who work hard in the, in the Lord's work within his church. But the big part of our job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so the work of the ministry is also not just what happens in this building. The work of the church is primarily, I want you to hear this, is primarily the church at work. So if you are a teacher, you are a lawyer, um, you're an engineer, especially if you're a civil engineer, bless you, our bridges can be driven across. And we looked last week that the implications of Genesis 1, God did a very, a very incredible structuring of creation, and then he filled it where it was teeming with all kind of living uh, things and, and plants and, and fruit and vegetables and animals. And then he got to creating man in his own image, male and female. He created them. And he said, he did that because he said, let, that the triune God said, let us make man in our image. And an image bearer is who you and I are. And so, in fact, you can throw up the last, slide there. Genesis um, 1, I, I kind of quickly went through it, but Genesis 1, 31, it says, and God saw all that he had done, he'd made, this is day six of creation, behold, it was very good. So he had been saying, let there be light, it was good. Uh, let there be, you know, let me separate the heavens and the earth, let me fill it, and he said, it was good, it was good, and he gets to the sixth day, and he stands back and looks at the structure, and the structure helped provide for abundance and teeming, swarming. 
So you have both structure and abundance, which is needed for flourishing, which is what God intends. And he says, let us make man in our image. He did that, and he looked, took it all in, and he says, it's very good. Why? Well, because his creation was already good. But then he's saying, now as my image bearers, be fruitful and multiply. Make this puppy flourish. Some of you, triple type A, engineers, structure this puppy. And then artists, fill this puppy. It's not a puppy, it's a world. He's saying, bear my image by being a creator. Be creative, but don't be exploitative. Bring out of it what is there and be a blessing to others. And, and, and he blessed them and he said, go and be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Have some, put some controls in, edge your yard, whatever, and rule over it. And so he says, it's very good. Here's the two things I want you to notice. is within God's intent, intent and original design both with his creation broad and uh, particularly now, I guess this one element would mean only us as human beings, as his image bearers. You have both authority that he has given us and vulnerability, but the good kind of vulnerability. Vulnerability where there's not suspicion and fear and shame. And got my eye, one eye here and one eye there. But authority and vulnerability, and if you think about it, anyone that you're like, man, I'm really drawn to just how they live their life, you, you, you see some sense of the right use of power. All authority is, um, is the capacity to, to make something, to do something good. It's the capacity. Authority is that. Now, it can be twisted, and we'll see that in a moment. But when you see authority being used for the benefit and blessing of others, you say, very good. And if you know someone who uh, has authority, but they cause others to live in an insecure vulnerability, now they're, um, they're putting them in, a, in a, a place that's insecure, where they are using them, exploiting them, now you say, that's not good. So a beautiful thing in creation, God's original creation, is structure and teeming abundance where you have authority and a vulnerability that you go, this is beautiful. This captures me and captivates me. And that's the way it was. And last week we talked about as God made us image bearers, any king during that time put his image all throughout his realm, meaning it would have been a statue or some kind of emblem as far as you can get, you go to, to Cleburne, to El Paso, whatever, and there was some reminder of who's in charge and who's the king. And God said, I'm going to send out my image, but it's going to be through you. And so therefore, you're going to reflect me to the creation, and then you're going to reflect the creation back to me in praise and lament and prayer. And so God intended us to bear his image. Now, we're going to get to a second purpose for us as image bearers as the spill out of today, which is to restore the image because something happened and we're in the backwash of it today. Look at Genesis 3. Genesis 3. And actually, we're going to start in chapter 2, verse 25. While you're turning, I'm going to take my blind eyes over here and get my glasses. It'll be on the screen if you don't have a copy of God's Word. But this is the end of the, the second telling of creation in chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. That's only Adam and Eve so far. They shall become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And we don't have time to camp on it, but you go, that's just odd. What, what, why are we saying that? I mean, we wish we could be in that scenario. Yeah, well, they're naked, and hey, everything's good. But you'd think they, they were naked, and they were enjoying the creation, or they were naked, and they were, you know, using power correctly, whatever it is. But he uses, they were unashamed. They were not ashamed. 
And that's an indicator that the author is readying us for that to make its entrance. So look at chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. We're going to read it, and then we're going to talk about the fall and look at the fallout uh, of the fall for us. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. I just put a question mark in my margin there going, Did God say that last part? Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Let me pause there. We could do an entire sermon series on the sad state of passive men. That's the only thing I'm going to say. Verse 7, because Adam is also guilty. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. Okay, so the fruit did something, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. You have the first trip to the Gap or to the outlet mall. They make themselves clothes. So this is the fall. This is the big part of our story as to why we're not living in eternal bliss. We're living in the wake of in the backwash of these decisions, these decisions of Eve and Adam. I want you to, I'm going to give a couple of observations. We're going to look at this kind of as a case study on, we all face temptation, and it will often take this similar pattern, and we are wiser if we take heed of that, But that's not going to be the ultimate thing. The ultimate is like, okay, what does this mean now? What happens to the story? What happens to God's purposes and plans? What happens to us? What happens to the image of God that he made us in? Is it gone? So first I want you to note the the dialogue with the devil. Um, I made one, you know, observation of she mentions not touching the tree. We'll look in just a second if he said that or not. Uh, But the devil himself begins, or the serpent, who is Satan. Um, Another observation, remember, he said, you know, you're going to rule over the fish and the creeping things and all that. The serpent is subservient to Eve and Adam. They rule over, or are supposed to rule over, and now they're taking conversation with, an appointment with the serpent. They're in, she's entertaining what the serpent is saying. And he's casting doubt. He's twisting and casting doubt within Eve. And I think you could boil it down to, is God holding out on you? I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is pretty nice, but like, he, he said, uh-uh. He said, No. Is he holding out on you? You could really say that it's the temptation is maybe I should mistrust God. Maybe he is holding out on me. Maybe life isn't all the life that it could be. And so he has, he's working her and he's twisting. He's using God's word and he's twisting God's word. And He says some things that really appeal to her. He says, you surely will not die. And then he says, 
later on in that verse, your eyes are going to be open and you will be like God. Now that, those two tapped a nerve, did something within Eve. Surely you will not die. You will be like God. Now, if you sneak a peek back at chapter 2, these aren't on slides. Chapter 2, verses 7 to 9, you see that, that God formed Adam. He breathed into his nostrils. He made him a living being. He planted him in the garden. That's where he placed the man. He caused the trees to grow. And he mentions the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then in 15, the Lord God put the man there uh, to cultivate it and to keep it. And he commanded the man, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. And then he tells Adam, um, the Lord knows that it's not good for man to be alone. He says, let me let Adam feel that, and then I'm going to provide for that need. He goes, I'm going to give you a job. In fact, this is real authority. You name everything, flying, swimming, crawling. Um, one of the best plays I've ever seen was a high school play where they did some adaptation of this uh, comical one, and Adam is your typical male. He keeps hitting snooze on his deal, and he's got to get up and name the animals, and he starts to name the animals. Now, we're not told that Eve's on the scene yet, but in this play she was, and he goes, swimmer, flyer, very lazy man-like. In the play, they have Eve go, well, what's that one called? That's a swimmer. She said, but that swimmer has blue scales, and that one has green. And she starts to say, you got to do better. <laughs> it is hilarious. But it's amazing the authority that he gives man. And he says, to see what he will name them. He is not told. Now, name them, but you cannot say, you know, X, Y, and Z. He says, name them. And we have some weird names because Adam probably, you know, there was a C plus on that name. Who knows? But he has the authority to name. That's a huge authority. And then he makes, a, a, he takes Adam and he had formed Adam. We know this, you know this very well. But he took a rib out of Adam, went to surgery, and got the rib out and fashioned Eve. And the idea is, I mean, she's gorgeous and Adam, we just put up with you. That's really it. And then when Adam wakes up and comes to and he sees her, he begins to erupt in song. And he's basically, you know, basically like, the girl is mine. It was the original rendition of it. Bone of bones, flesh of my flesh. He is enthralled with her. What I want you to note, two things. Before the fall, we already talked about this last week with work. Before the fall, you have good food, abundant, tasty, nourishing food. You have meaningful work, uh, and you have enjoyable, satisfying sex in marriage, okay? So you have those three things before the fall. The other thing I want you to note is he says, you can eat from all the trees, and you can have filet mignon. You just can't touch, he didn't say you can't, you can't eat from that one tree. So, is God a God of, you know, restriction, killjoy? No. He's like, do you realize how many versions of pear I made? You, you realize how, how many saltwater fish? Because I know you don't want to eat the freshwater fish, but the saltwater fish, you realize how many I made? Like, enjoy. God is a God of generosity, lavish generosity. Before the fall, these things were all already there, already good gifts of God. But that isn't where our story begins. I mean, that's where our story begins, but it's not where our story ends up today, and it's not where our story ends up as God's image bearers as we keep going along. But back to chapter 3. They had intimacy in, in chapter 2. They had intimacy, protection, provision. They had God's good gifts. They had authority, and they enjoyed vulnerability without suspicion or shame. And then she took and ate. Gave to him, passive boy, and he took and ate. Why? Well, look at the text. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, 
God wants you to really know he's right there. And he ate. It's because right up above that, when the woman saw that the, the tree was good for food, which God had given abundantly, it was a delight to the eyes. It was aesthetically pleasing. And it was desirable to make one wise. That's when she took and ate. It's important to note that. Satan talks with her, casts doubt. You might even say, used, I'm going to say, the concept of shame before maybe there was shame or not shame. Does shame need sin to be in the world? I'm not sure. But what shame is for us is I'm not enough. I'm not competent. I don't matter. Something is lacking. Something is flawed and lacking I don't have it. All he was doing was, did God withhold a little bit from you? Is he, is he good? Is he really good? Can you really trust him? Don't you want to be like him? And she said, yes. So I will take whatever that was. And she ate. Well, what was the fallout from that? Verses 8 to 24. We're not going to go through them other than just to me kind of rehearse them uh, back with you. But you, verse 8. Uh, Verse 7, they hid themselves and they made fig leaves. Verse 8, they heard the Son of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees. That's hilarious. Like, he's not going to find them. But it is a common response of those who feel shame and fracture and insecurity, guilt, all the above. Now, guilt would be appropriate. They broke his his one rule that he gave him. And then God does what, what God does well. You see it in the life of Jesus. Often he just asks a question. Do you want to be healed? What do you want me to do for you? What does the law say to you? What is he doing? He's going for the heart to draw out the heart. And he call, calls to the man, where are you? Well, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now, did God know that he ate from there? Yeah. This is like you with your kid, and you know your kid did something. Now, how did that, how did that go missing from the pantry? The man said, and here's where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just kind of skip through it, but it's on the slide here. They go from hiding to now, how did, well, what happened? And he goes, well, that woman you gave me. And he gets to the woman, and she says, well, the serpent. <laughs> so they go from feeling the shame, there's this fracture, they go to hiding and blaming. But then God gives them the just, painful consequences of transgressing his one rule, of sin against him. And he says, first of all, he, he talks to the serpent. Because you've done this, cursed are you. You're going to walk on your belly. Verse 15, this is, the, this is a glimpse of the gospel for the first time. Fancy people call it the proto-evangelion, the first gospel. It's just a hint. You've done this. You've messed up my image bearers. Now sin has fractured our relationship. It's brought alienation. It's brought shame. My good design is going to feel the effects and the corrosive pervasive effects of sin going forward, but I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And then he says, and by the way, also some of the consequences are to the woman. There's going to be painful. Uh, now there's going to be pain in childbearing. She hadn't born any children yet, so she didn't know that. Now she knows there won't be any um, C-sections at Plano um, Presbyterian on a scheduled time. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt a lot. But then also, he says, there's going to be this conflict and alienation and struggle within you as husband and wife. And I had a prophet, DTS, um, say, now when it says she had desire for him, everybody talks about, you know, she's going to wish that he wasn't the leader of the household. He goes, this is all about her sexual desire. I'm like, I'm sorry. Have you been around? 
No, this is a desire that, yes, could be that kind of desire, but it's a desire to, I don't want the situation I'm in. I don't like this feeling that maybe you're the leader, I'm not, all that kind of stuff. He's introducing the idea that there's going to be pain out of this. You were naked and unashamed. You had harmony, unity, intimacy. And now within the uh, couple, there's going to be strife. There's going to be fear. There's going to be passive aggressive and aggressive aggressive. And you're going to live in the same house. And then he also says to Adam, curse is the ground because of you and toil you will eat of it. So now work is going to be painful. It's going to take sweat. There's going to be thorns and thistles. It's going to be really hard to make that money, to put food on the table. And just when you have a bumper crop, I'm going to send a tornado. No, he's not saying that directly, but he's saying sin is going to have its effects. It will be harder to be productive. You're still going to have times of creativity, productivity, and flourishing. And when you follow me, and, and you make yourself vulnerable and dependent on me and you follow me, there's, it gives you a chance, it gives you the wisdom, it gives you the advantage to be fruitful and multiplying and keeping and cultivating to a flourishing kind of way. Well, I want us to see the fallout from the fall that we are image bearers, the next slide, just in telling the story. He made us in his image to bear his image, to reflect him to creation, reflect creation back to him, to be fruitful and multiply and to cause um, by your good work, um, where you work, to be a blessing and a benefit to God's creation and to others around you. That's what he originally intended. But that image is not gone. The image of God, I'm, I'm taking this from Lanier Burns, my theology prophet, DTS. I love this phrase. He said, the image of God is defaced, but not erased. Defaced is like graffiti on a wall. Defaced is blemished, defaced is mangled, defaced is twisted, but it's not erased. And we're going to get to the next two weeks. We're also not only supposed to bear the image, which is his original design, he still calls us to it because he repeats that to Noah after the flood. But we're, the next part of our calling is to restore the image. Everywhere the image is twisted, distorted, where, where people are image bearers being exploited, he says, I put you as my image in those places. It's not an accident where you live, not an accident where you work, not an accident that co-worker you have a conflict with because I want my image to be born in that place so that there can be beauty and benefit and blessing through you. But the image of God is defaced, not erased. Therefore, and I love this, um, we, uh, we talked about this kind of the beginning of the year, like what's your word for the year kind of deal, and I was, I was proud. I felt like I rubbed off on Mike because he's a man of very few words, and I'm a very man of a lot of words. And he said, well, I'm going to have to cheat. I'm going to use two phrases. I was like, yes. He hadn't cried yet much, but, but he's getting, we're getting there. And he said, my words for this year are from Romans 8. Groan inwardly, wait eagerly. You know what Romans 8's about? It's about the fallout from the fall. All the corrosive and pervasive effects of sin that... Stuff just breaks. It doesn't last. That it's just hard. That relationships get fractured and there's insecurity and there's, um, you know, Lord of the Flies. Who can, who can get over the top of whom to get ahead? And Paul says, hey, we're all groaning until God completes this deal and brings renewal to all things. He says, until then, we groan inwardly. But we still wait eagerly. We've not lost hope. But our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in duct taping this sucker together. Our hope is not manufacturing our own security, significance, and life. But it's trusting in him and waiting eagerly. And the creation is groaning outside. The creation is groaning for the adoption of God's sons and daughters. And that's really the backwash, if you will, but I'm going to keep going. The next fallout is where I want to, where I've wanted to get. Because as we look at Eve and Adam falling into sin, 
we need to realize that it's it's not just for the grace of God, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I. It's there go I all the time. There go I with a, a triggered response um, in anger. There go I in, well, I'll just fudge numbers here because I need a little bit over here. There go I in clutching what God has given me when I have it in my hand and I could provide it for those in need, but I, I can't let go of that because I need that security. See, God gave them good gifts. He gave them authority. He gave them vulnerability where it's appropriate. God himself, you look at the life of Jesus, he is in authority. He is in charge, and he completely makes himself vulnerable to be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, to, to be interrupted by children climbing on his lap and telling his disciples, get off, let them come to me, or to the woman who you know, been bleeding for 12 years, and, and his disciples are like, hey, you can't be bothered. And he's like, no, he stops. And he calls her daughter. Makes himself vulnerable. He doesn't respond. He doesn't revile back when he's reviled in his, his you know, kangaroo court hearings, if you will. They're not hearings. But he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. That's vulnerability. You think about it. You're not drawn to the person who's got the badge and the title, and they can just kick rear in and take names, authority. But they're closed off, isolated, could care less about you, or is it couldn't care less about you? I always forget. You're not drawn to that person. Why? Because there's not a fitting of vulnerability. You feel discarded by them. You feel ignored by them, used by them, whatever it is. God intends his image bearers to have appropriate authority. Where he's given you a platform, where he's put you, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, your address where you live is not an accident. That job you're in and you're like, oh, I just can't take one more week of this. You're there this week. And there's stuff that you could be about where the image of God defaced but not erased could be born through your life in that place, doing excellent work, exercising authority that is a blessing and benefit to your coworkers. And God's like, there it is, there it is, there's my image. But making false gods and playing God is what has come out of the fall where we live out what happened there all the time. The fancy words for these two are idolatry and injustice. Now, we think injustice is a political word and idolatry is a religious word. So, buddy, let's just concentrate on idolatry because we're talking about religious words, and I know we can all get it, kind of get off a little bit of offline. And, you know, well, if you look at the prophets, they hit these suckers one two punch one two punch one two punch you've made false gods why don't you let your uh, i love isaiah he gets real sarcastic why don't you let your false god fix you the one you had to go back and renail so it would stand up let your false god save you and by the way because you you worship you made that god so you could live how you wanted to which is to build your customers over here to to um harass your neighbor to exploit them that's injustice funny, those who get real up in arms about, why are we always talking about injustice? All that means is what every one of us feel. There's something wrong in the world. You may not feel what somebody else feels, but there's something wrong in the world. There's something wrong in the world is sin. I have a quote somewhere, uh, William, on there. It's like G.K. Chesterton years ago, it's alleged. They couldn't track down if this really happened, but it fits him and his character that there, there was a newspaper the editor that said, hey, what's wrong with the world? Kind of like, you know, let me hear from you. And he wrote back this letter in response. Dear sir, I am yours, G.K. Chesterton. That's the truth. Now go back to the, the side we were just on. I want us to, uh, and I'm, I'm going to kind of wrap it here. We're going to come back to this when we talk about restoring the image. 
Part of why it's hard for us to bear the image and restore the image is because we do this. We make false images. And what a false image is, or what idolatry is, is basically the authority that God has given us to make something in the world, and it's run amok. It's gotten twisted. It's gotten, it's gotten self-interested, self-promoting, self-protecting, self-indulging. And the irony of idols, and sorry, and, and on there, when, when the serpent says, you surely will not die, he's touching that you, you don't have to be vulnerable, and you're going to be like God, like you're going to have life by the tail. That's the false promise of every idol. So let's take one thing. Before the fall, God had created grapes. I don't think wine had been created yet. God created grapes. It's good. Those who are viticulturalists and then whatever the other people are called that make wine, they go through a complex process and they take very attentive care and they take those grapes and they do certain things with them to where then it becomes, goes from good to very good. But if someone takes a very good thing and begins to not just enjoy it, not just savor it, not just um, be enriched by it in some way, but it becomes like, well, this is helping me not feel vulnerable. Like, let me have a couple more of these before I walk into this gathering, this social gathering, so I can be myself. And then also, let me do this so I can have control, because I feel like out of control. I feel, so now I'm, now you're not, in, now you're not enjoying wine. You're actually after the alcohol. And what the alcohol does, ironically, it becomes an idol, because I'm not even after wine anymore. Now it's about how much alcohol can I get. Now, now I need more alcohol than I had before, because it does, it keeps diminishing, right? The false promises of all idols, you won't die. You don't have to feel vulnerable. We got you, and you'll be like God. You'll have control, authority, and you won't have to be fearful. And ironically, what happens is we go in making it, and then we become like it. You will become like the false image you make, and then actually it gets turned on its head. I went in freely with the authority to make this idol, make it most important in my life, the thing that I was going to have and now I have to have, and ironically now I go from that to powerless and enslaved. And God's like, that's not life and life to the full. And if you're in that, you can put in any blank. It could be my kid's achievement. If my kids can just achieve in sports or in school, if they could just be top of their class, if they could be a D1 recruit, if they could do this, this, and this, and you're like going for it, and it's exhilarating, and then they, you know, they, they make straight A's, and then they make honor roll, and then they, they get a recruiter contacting them about their sport, and you're all in, and then all of a sudden you're like, holy cow, somehow got flipped on its head. I have zero time. My child really is stressed out, but we're too, it's too late to get off this train, and we become enslaved. That is idolatry. I'm not coming down here. That is what we've got to be aware of. Just simply for this week, where is it you're tempted or where is it you're in process or where is it that you have made a false god? Or where is it that you're playing God? See, that's the injustice part, where I will exploit others, use others, ignore others, do whatever it takes for mine at the expense of others. Where am I tempted in one of these areas? Because you can trace it back to, ask yourself, am I tempted to think, okay, I'm not going to be vulnerable anymore. I got life by the tail. I'm in charge. I'm in control. Just recognize the warning from the prophets, from Moses through Genesis and through Romans 1. Paul, I call it the tragic exchange. He said they exchanged the creator for the creature. And they were no longer thankful, and boy, it messed their lives up, though they thought they got life by the tail. I want us to hear the warning. I wore black on purpose because Adam is us. We're going to have to finish this next time. But we are in, it's in our, sin is in our bloodline. It's in our backstory. And he's the first Adam. But thanks be to God, 
that second Adam, Jesus, the true, true image of God came. And he stood in my place. He took my place and yours on the cross. For rebellious, idol maker, idolater me and you. And through the one man, Adam, sin entered to all of us, so all of us have sinned. But through the other, and because of what he did, there can be life, eternal life in him. We're going to pray. We're not going to sing. I apologize. And I, I want to pray for you as you go and me as we go to consider what God has put before us from his word. Lord, you are good. You are gracious. We acknowledge our need for you. Thank you that our sin, though sin is repulsive, our sin, our suffering, that maybe it's someone else's sin that's part of why we're in a bad place or suffering, the fracture in relationships we have, Lord, none of those repulse you from us. They actually ignite your heart of compassion. When we sang Son of Suffering from Isaiah 53, you're a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and that you were pierced through for our transgressions. So you thank you, Lord, that in your grace and in your mercy, your heart is ignited toward us when we are flailing. But Lord, some of us, we need you to wake us up. We are adrift. We are numb to you. And I pray that, Lord, we don't, this isn't a guilt thing, but that we hear your invitation out of whatever it is that has us trapped. And Lord, we pray that you might cause us to bear your image a little more truly this week, simply because the real us did business with the real you. And the real you is a God of all grace, a God of all mercy. Pray that that grace in this moment, maybe where we're in a tender spot, where we're in a place of feeling conviction, Lord, that you give us the courage to stay in it with you until you do a transforming work in us, until we repent, until we confess, until we experience your forgiveness again and your fellowship, fellowship with you restored. May that be the spill out of our lives as we go this week so that Christ would not only be named and honored today, right now, but as we go. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Have a great, great week.